I start with the introduction? I'm gonna quick introduce if that's okay. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for and welcome to this uh, session at the LSA Phonetics One Part Two. My name is Meg Sikash and I will be the chair today. So I'll be moderating the questions. Um, <clears throat> there are, are a couple different ways that you can ask questions after the talk. The talks will be 20 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for questions. You can ask in the Q&A box and then I will ask your question out loud. So you, chat, you can just use the chat function there and write it. Or you can raise your hand and then we can give you the option. We'll turn your uh, mic on and you can ask your question out loud. Either one works. I'll moderate the questions. And uh, um, with that, we will begin. Up first, we have Chelsea Sinker, and she's going to be talking about homophone discrimination based on speaker specific learning. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about how li whether listeners can discriminate between homophone mates on how this might be influenced by exposure to the particular speaker. So, first, just thinking about what phonetic details we have in our representations, because they certainly exist in our phonological representations. So either sort of in the underlying form in the phonetic implementation rules, they're certainly there somewhere. Um, and we see this based on language specific realizations of what we treat as being the same sound, that it can have different prototypical pronunciations in different languages. And you can also get speakers to change their prototypical realizations in production and also their expectations in perception based on exposing them to manipulated um, stimuli that they're hearing or different speakers that they're talking to. So certainly we do have these details um, in the representations of particular sounds. So then we can think about, well, do we have also phonetic details in the lexical representation? Do we have these associated with particular words? And homophones are a really nice test of looking at that because you have things that are lexically distinct, but phonologically the same. And there is some previous work that demonstrates that homophone mates can exhibit significant acoustic differences in production. So like time, the spice is different from time, what your clock tells you um, in duration and other things that you can measure, but in production, whereas in perception tests, listeners generally can't discriminate between homophone mates. You can't just show them, uh, present them with the word time and ask them which of these words was it um, that you heard. So then we can think about, well, why aren't listeners doing better than chance there? Um, and, and could there be particular conditions where they actually might do better than chance? So some of the possibilities are that discrimination might require speaker specific learning. So in order to have that, then listeners would have to be presented with stimuli just from a single speaker. So there isn't variation across speakers causing more uncertainty. And they'd also need to have items that are unambiguous from context so that some of the items they're hearing are things that they know uh, that they can identify unambiguously. Um, whereas you have the other trials where they aren't sure what they're hearing um, and you have the homophone mate pairs. So there are two main types of predictions about how exposure to the speaker might matter. So first, you might have exposure to the speaker mattering just because it improves familiarity with that speaker's particular vocal tract. So what we're expecting in their realization of the phonological system, um, but also habits in other systematic patterns, like how they're impacted by frequency. So how much shorter are higher frequency words? What other reduction patterns do they have? Um, and so on. So these are things where the production of one set of words has predictable patterns that can be extended to other words. But we can also imagine learning that is word specific. So less systematic things um, like emotional valence or other associations of particular words where the associations that you have with a particular word and the way you pronounce it based on that meaning um, won't tell you about how another word might be realized. So we can expect some things that are speaker-based learning that are true across words um, and other things that are word specific. So what I'm going to be presenting are results from a word identification task um, to look at how exposure to the speaker can influence listeners' accuracy in identifying homophones. So first, can listeners distinguish between homophone mates when they've heard this speaker, the same voice producing different tokens of the same exact words that they're going to be hearing later. So different tokens, but same words. Um, and then 
can listeners distinguish between homophone mates when they've heard the voice, but not saying these particular words? So they've heard the voice saying some words, but not the particular words that they're being tested on. So the participants were all native speakers of American English, 128 of them. The study was run online. Um, so here's the basic layout of the task design, and I'll go into detail of it uh, in the next slides. So basically words were presented auditorily. Each um, stimulus was just a single word in isolation, and listeners were asked to identify it by selecting the written option that matched it. And all of the stimuli were produced by a single individual, one native speaker um, of American English. So there were four conditions based on two different training conditions uh, and two different um, conditions uh, for testing. So first, the training conditions. So the training phase had people listening to words um, where their two response options were phonologically distinct. So it's going to be unambiguous what word it is that you're hearing out of these two options. So these are things like night versus neat. You know which one of those you heard because they're phonologically contrasted in English. So the two conditions were <laughs> condition one, that the training pairs included the words that would also appear, appear in the homophone task. So here we have the word night, where your written option tells you which version of night it is, that is, uh, it's night without a K, not night with a K, um, which you know because you're seeing it written down um, when you're hearing it. And then the second condition is training pairs that only include words that wouldn't be, wouldn't appear in the homophone task. So the same number of items um, roughly match to uh, include similar phonological forms. So all of the same vowels in the same environments to the extent possible. So these are things like pipe, peep, where the, neither of those words are things that you would end up hearing in the homophone identification task. So the test phase is the main task of interest um, where this is where people were identifying uh, homophones. So they were choosing between two orthographically distinct homophone mates. So like you would hear night and then your two response options would be these two forms that I've written down here. So that is night without a K, night with a K. Um, and you just have to decide, you know, which of those did you hear, but they're orthographically distinct. So you can make a distinction um, in which meaning you're thinking of. And participants all always heard both of the homophone mates of that pair um, in randomized order. And there are 20 pairs of homophone mates. And um, remember the training stimuli and the test stimuli were always distinct tokens. Um, so even though these were words that they had heard in the training phase, they weren't the same exact tokens they heard. So it was the same speaker saying the same words. They were different instances of that speaker saying these words. So there were two conditions for the stimuli based on the sentences that they were originally produced in. So they were always presented in isolation, just the target word, but they came from two different types of sentences. So the first type of uh, sentences were just the same frame sentence. So the word is sun. Um, or the word is, you know, X, whatever word. Uh, and then the other uh, type of sentence were just naturalistic sentences of a similar length and always also with the target word being sentence final, like we took a picture of the sun. Um, so this is just because some of the previous uh, work finding differences in the production of homophone mates um, has found that it is sensitive to the context that the word is produced in, that if you have meaningful naturalistic sentences, homophones are most likely to have differences, whereas if they're produced um, in isolation or in frame sentences where you're not really using the meaning of the word, you're just referring to the word in this meta way, sometimes that doesn't exhibit differences. So that's why I included that uh, as one of the factors. So there are a few different um, hypotheses that we might make and predict how the, two, the conditions will come out based on the different types of training. So one possibility is that listeners acclimate to the speaker, so they become more familiar with the speaker based on having the training phase where they've been listening to this speaker and making decisions between these words that are pretty clear. Um, and then subsequently, they'll be able to make decisions um, about systematic patterns like frequency-based reduction uh, and other things that might uh, distinguish between homophone mates based on previous work, um, which then could produce above chance discrimination of homophone mates in both of the training conditions. So any amount of exposure to the speaker, regardless of if it's the same words that you're now being tested on 
or not could produce above chance accuracy. Uh, alternatively, we could have speakers <laughs> learning particular word, listeners becoming familiar with particular words as said by that speaker. So getting used to, all right, this is how this speaker tends to say this word, um, which could include differences like emotional valence and other ways um, that homophone mates might differ that are specific just to that particular pair of words and their particular meanings um, that might result in a variety of different patterns um, in how they're pronounced. Um, so these are things that are going to be just word specific in which case listeners would only be above chance at discriminating between homophone mates if they had previously heard the speaker saying these particular words. So not just being exposed to the speaker. So in this case, we would only see above chance accuracy um, in the condition where listeners had been exposed to these homophones as said by the speaker. And lastly, we might predict just no learning at all that it doesn't matter if you've heard the speaker before or not because there are no systematic phonological differences given that previous work has generally found um, that listeners aren't above chance uh, at deciding which of two homophone mates they heard. So here's the main summary of the results. So this is a logistic misdefects model for accuracy of homophone identifications. Um, so it includes a random intercept by a listener and by homophone mate pair. So the main uh, results that we are interested in. So here, our first line for the intercept shows that listeners were significantly above chance at deciding which homophone mate they heard when they had been exposed to these particular homophones in the training phase. And they were significantly worse when they hadn't been exposed um, to these homophones in the training phase. So when they hadn't been exposed to the homophones, just the voice saying different words, uh, listeners weren't significantly above chance. And then there was no effect of the context that the words were extracted from. So whether it was a frame sentence um, or the meaningful sentences didn't make a difference as a main effect or in interaction. And here's just a visualization of those same results. You can see accuracy right about at chance um, when the training just included other words produced by that speaker uh, and accuracy significantly above chance um, when the training uh, included these particular words that listeners were being tested on. But one of the notable things to keep in mind here is that accuracy was significantly above chance, but it was still somewhat small. So this is about 53% accuracy, which should inform what sorts of analyses we come up with for what's going on, um, for why listeners are able to do this at above chance accuracy. So one of the other things that I wanted to comment on was variation by the pair of words. So first looking at the condition um, where their exposure was just to this voice saying different words, not the particular homophone mates that they ended up hearing in the testing. And we see this distribution centered at 0.5 um, and it's basically normal. So there are only 20 homophone mate pairs, which is why you don't see a you know, perfect um, normal curve, but basically um, that seems to be essentially the distribution that we're seeing here. Whereas we see a very different distribution in the condition where listeners were exposed to these particular homophone mates as said by this speaker. So you see about half of the words that have accuracy around 0.5, but then the other half are substantially higher. So we see this whole group of words, um, uh, homophone mate pairs with substantially higher accuracy. And I always grouped the words together by pair instead of separating out the individual homophone mates because there are often strong preferences for choosing one or the other, often just because one is higher frequency. So there are strong preferences. So you always want to look at homophone mate responses um, in pairs. So this is just looking at, well, what were those particular words with the high accuracy? So this is looking at everything uh, that had above 55% accuracy uh, on average um, to think about what might be driving some of that accuracy for particular pairs. So. The study wasn't really designed to pin down what the particular characteristics were semantically or acoustically. So this part is a little bit speculative, but just thinking about what would the future directions be that we've established that listeners are picking up on something. What is it that they're picking up on and why do those differences exist? So some of the things that we can note semantically that look sort of suggestive are that some of these pairs that uh, have this higher accuracy have strong positive or negative associations for one of the words um, or strong size associations like flea or whale for one of the words. 
where we might think about some of either the emotional valence associations or you know sound symbolism for size differences uh, that could be um, popping up here. So this is something I'm not going to present um, any statistics on that because there aren't enough items for anything to reach significance and it would all be post hoc. Um, but sort of thinking about you know where what would we want to do next to try to pin down what's going on. And acoustically, you certainly do find that two utterances of the same word are more similar than two utterances of the two distinct homophone mates. Um, so there certainly are differences that seem to be what listeners are picking up on. And you find this in a variety of dimensions that you might think of measuring. So you see it in vowel duration, you see it um, in F0, uh, and in the timing of the F0 peak, a variety of things, which again, don't reach significance with only a set of 20 pairs, but we could think about, you know, in a larger data set, you might be able to identify which of these are contributing the most to the things that listeners are actually remembering and noticing. So just to summarize um, the results, first, when listeners just were trained on tokens of different words produced by this speaker, accuracy for identifying homophones was at chance. So this first demonstrates that listeners don't have pre-existing strong expectations about how, how homophone mates should differ, because if they did, they should be better than chance accuracy, even without any training, uh, without any exposure to the speaker. But it also demonstrates that exposure to the speaker, uh, just um, saying other words, doesn't really help. So it isn't that they now have this reference point for the speaker that will help them evaluate phonological contrasts or other systematic things like frequency conditioned reduction um, that you know they know now a lot about this speaker and what to expect from the speaker, but that isn't helping them with these particular words because they haven't heard these particular words. But we see that accuracy was above chance after exposure to tokens of these same words produced by this speaker. So it suggests that listeners are learning detail that is specific to the word and specific to the speaker. So these have to be non-systematic characteristics uh, of each word. So not systematic patterns of how this speaker behaves while saying all words, but things that can't be reliably predicted based on one set of words and applied to a new set of words. So the last we can, thing we can keep in mind here is, as I said, accuracy is just at 53%. Um, so it's not that these homophones have developed phonological contrasts, it's still sort of a subtle effect. But we can think about what is the status of these details that listeners are picking up on? Because the results do suggest that we have word specific memories. And this is consistent with some previous work that we've also seen that listeners recognize particular tokens of this is a recording that I have heard before, this recording of this word as said by this speaker, which is also a sort of gradient effect. So if you have two tokens that aren't identical, but are similar in various acoustic dimensions, you get some of the same effects of familiarity. And listeners also uh, can learn um, patterns particular to certain speakers. So they can both say, you know, is this speaker someone I've heard before or not, but also when they're being trained on altered characteristics um, phonetically, um, they can learn to associate those with certain speakers and instead of learning them as generalizations. So we do have speaker specific learning, um, which might be fitting into these memories for word specific learning. So what I think we can best explain these as are basically exemplar memories like has been proposed previously in exemplar models, um, which say, all right, we have memories of each of these instances of having heard this word with all of the details of that production of that word um, along with who said it uh, and so on. But also in the hybrid models, for exemplar models, <laughs> you also need to account for, well, it isn't just that I have all these memories of these words, but I also have these connections between all the times this particular sound has been said across different words and across different speakers. So we have these different levels of abstraction and that phonological level of abstraction is for the most part going to vastly outweigh all of these word specific details because you have so much more information that's telling you about this is how this sound is pronounced based on all of this consistency across all of these different words. So having one sort of outlier in the production of a particular word is something that is going to be averaged out and not have an effect uh, unless you have 
substantial evidence for it um, to sort of override um, all the other information that you're getting that's saying how that sound is generally going to be expected to be produced. Um, so it isn't that a word is going to very easily jump into a new category or develop a phonological representation that includes details that are not contrasted in any other words in the phonology of that language. But on the other hand, we do have these memories. So it's these are things that are sort of uh, phonetic details that are available um, to, to the speakers, sort of if they are presented in a context that makes them salient, like in this task. So you can get word-specific learning for sort of arbitrary details, but it takes extensive exposure. So you can see this um, in tasks with manipulated altered acoustic feedback, where you're getting hundreds of instances of three words where you can sort of get them doing different things. But most of the time in most tasks, you do not have hundreds of instances of that word. And in this case, um, we just had one. So it's not the case that listeners have altered their representations of these words based on that single token of exposure in this task. But I think they have to be drawing on these pre-existing associations, which is why it has to be connecting them to something um, like emotional valence or other sorts of associations that have just been made salient, that you've just heard these utterances of this word being produced in particular ways, such that you can draw on those connections, those details that you have somewhere um, in the memory of these words that have just sort of been drawn to the forefront in this case, uh, such that they aren't being sort of ignored for the broader phonological representation based on these very recent salient memories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for that really interesting talk. Um, we have about seven minutes for questions. And again, if you're just recently joining us, you can either ask your question by writing it in the Q&A box and I will read it out loud, or you can raise your hand and then we will unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. And maybe while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I can ask one if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was really surprised that you didn't find an effect between the wor uh, words as embedded in sentences versus isolated. I really like expected to see something there just because you get all the context in the sentences. And so I was trying to think of myself as someone participating in this study, and I was wondering if maybe you would find a difference in that condition, like in the latter half of the trials, if you kind of teased it apart that way. Like maybe if you're sitting there at the beginning of the experiment and you're getting like all these things kind of thrown at you, um, particularly because I'm not, I'm not sure if you if this was in the training, I'm not sure if that condition was also present in the training or not. But anyways, maybe, you know, by the time you get to the latter half of the trials, maybe you're like, okay, now I know that there are like some of these tokens that are a lot easier to figure out what word I should be choosing. So I don't know, maybe that's something. Yeah, I haven't about. actually thought about checking like differences in the trajectory across um, the, the trial number, but that would be interesting to look at, uh, assuming that that was actually recorded since I don't this was my first online study, so that might not be information that I actually have, but I might have it. Um, so yeah, that would be an interesting thing to look at. And I guess I'm not quite sure why I would expect not to have um, a difference um, between the two contexts, because as you say, like it is something that we've seen before that you sometimes get um, these acoustic differences. Um, so I guess it potentially could have something to do with uh, sort of the environment was always kept similar. So it was always sentence final, such that the position might be sort of overriding what other uh, effects you can have because that's also been found that, you know, a lot of the differences that we find in the production um, based on naturalistic sentences is just drawn by what was the prosodic position. Um, so it you, mean might the be you mean the target word was always sentence final? Yes. Um, so, so it might be that it's sort of a subtle enough effect once you control for these other things um, that it didn't turn out as significant. Um, because yeah, it is, it is somewhat surprising that we don't see uh, any difference there. I guess one of the other things that's potentially relevant to that is that I also tried to get uh, homophone mates that were fairly closely matched in frequency. 
So one of the differences that you sometimes see in meaningful sentences is that you're more likely to get the frequency-based effects of a word when it is in a meaningful context. Um, so I wanted to actually reduce that because I didn't want people to be picking up on sort of just, I can predict reduction based on frequency and guess accurately based on that because that isn't necessarily part of the actual representation. So there's only one pair, heard, heard, that actually had a substantial frequency-based um, difference. Um, so that also would be potentially uh, another reason why we wouldn't see an effect if it's really just frequency driving the effects previously observed. Yeah, that, yeah that's a very good idea to make sure that that's balanced between the, the items and the pairs. Yeah. Are there other questions for the speaker? Maybe you have some tips for conducting online studies right now. <laughs> uh, always have tester trials that you expect really high accuracy on such that you can exclude anyone who's below you know, 75% or something for those because otherwise you just get a lot of absolutely useless data. Uh, so yeah, I think in this one, I only ended up excluding six people for having accuracy at chance for the items that should have had accuracy close to 100%, but I've done other studies since that had even more. So I guess that was That's amazing. good because you, you said you had over 100 participants, right? Yeah, so I don't know yeah. why this one turned out really well and some others had like 30 participants who had to be replaced, um, but yeah. Uh, Jason is raising his hand. Let's see if I can unmute him. Josie, I was just gonna, I was gonna tell you later, but um, just beautiful discussion at the end of the talk. I mean, um, that, that really made sense to me. Um, so you're talking about this, this idea that um, you can uh, make you can kind of keep the phonetic detail on a speaker specific word specific basis but you have to have something to associate that detail with some more abstract concept. I think that's super interesting. Um, and it, I think it, it kind of suggests to me that maybe uh, these effects are also in the ear of the beholder to some extent. Um, so you might expect kind of participant specific differences. And so I wondered if you, um, you know, uh, kind of plotted out your, um, you know, random effects of, you had participants as a random, random factor. So mm -hmm. something like that, or if you, um, I, I don't know, if you do have it, that's a question. So do you think that that, that your discussion at the end makes that kind of prediction? I don't know. So, I mean, it does seem like we might make that prediction that if it's about making these associations that maybe that should differ um, by participants, this is uh, it's this isn't plotting the um, random intercepts by speaker, but just sort of the average accuracy um, by speaker. And it isn't clear, like it doesn't look like there are certain participants that are doing really well in driving the whole thing. Um, though there is, you know, some variation, it's not particularly striking. So, I guess to me, it looks sort of like most participants are really doing similar things. Though I think we equally well could have predicted that maybe some people really are thinking about it um, and sort of drawing on these sort of associations of particular words, but that ends up, it doesn't seem like that's really what we end up finding that we certainly could have um, imagined it. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more quick question. Um, Ivy Hauser asks, I think you said that the speakers must have learned word specific properties rather than general properties about the speaker or for example, frequency-based reduction patterns, could it be the case that there just wasn't enough training data for them to learn those kinds of patterns? So I, I guess it's possible that you would say that we actually just need more data to learn these sorts of patterns uh, by speaker. Um, I guess that, yeah, that's a fair point. So there were um, 160 trials um, of training. So it wasn't specifically designed to give a breadth of frequencies. So, so you might imagine that maybe to the extent that frequency-based reduction does vary a lot by speaker, um, that maybe that wouldn't be enough data for listeners to reliably learn it. But you know, if we make the connection to how long does it take speakers to take listeners to learn a particular voice and improve their accuracy for phonological identifications, people do that extremely quickly. 
but it is fair point that frequency based reduction can't be done based on a single token. You need a whole breadth of words of different frequencies to try to figure that out. Um, yeah, interesting point. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea. It was such an interesting talk. Um, and let's move on to our next speaker. Jonathan, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. Okay, so our next speaker is Jonathan Gibson. You can take it away. Awesome, thanks. Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for being here. I'm going to uh, be talking about looking at merged status with Palai scores, um, but building them on uh, dynamic formant contours instead of um, single uh, formant points. Um, I'm approaching this, um, I realize I didn't really say this in the slides, I'm approaching this basically from a sociophonetic perspective. Um, so that's sort of the background of, uh, of where I'm coming from. For this presentation, I'll talk about um, Pali scores in merger, and then I'll go on to my methods to outline an experiment that I conducted to get production and perception data from my participants. Um, the results will be a series of pretty plots, and then uh, there'll be some discussion at the end. So starting with background, um, when we talk about vowel merger, of course, we're talking about a, a loss of contrast between two categories. This is relevant in production and perception. It can operate differently. Um, it's not my intention to discuss um, which of those leads or which one is um, more important, but I would uh, welcome uh, feedback if I am making assumptions there that I'm not aware of. I'm going to focus on the low back merger today, the cot cot merger. This separates um, many North American dialects uh, from each other. In Wisconsin, um, for about as far back as the um, as recordings go, we can see that it's been um, a, a stable mess with pockets of merged and unmerged speakers kind of being um, side by side. And I mention this because I'm in uh, Wisconsin. That's where my data is coming from. Uh, thinking about how to measure merger in production, um, I, I've reproduced figures here from um, Nice and Halu's paper, which is just super valuable. Um, I've just added vowel labels, but the images are, are theirs. Um, there's sort of two broad ways to do it. Um, Euclidean distance is um, maybe the more intuitive way, which is uh, you get a whole bunch of tokens from two different vowels, and you get their center points and you get the distance in formant space between those two. But that ignores uh, token variability. So this image at the top is um, two potential speakers. So like gray speaker and orange speaker. And they have the same Euclidean distance between their two categories, but very different token variability. And I don't think when we think about what it means to be merged to the same degree. I don't think those two speakers are merged to the same degree. So Euclidean distance might be misleading, um, but looking at category overlap can help us um, uh, refine those models. So the gray speaker and the blue speaker um, look more overlapped, uh, similarly overlapped. Um, it's more about, it's less about the Euclidean distance. In fact, those values are different between those two. Um, looking at category overlap fits better conceptually with what merger is. Um, and uh, the, the way that I'm seeing is becoming the standard for measuring overlap is with the Pali score. Um, it's an output of a MANOVA um, model where you have F1 and F2, you have a series of points, and it just um, it's an output of that model that tells you how distinct the two are. I've reproduced here from, um, from Joey Stanley's blog. Um, this, this site is just super useful. If you're interested in Pali scores, I really recommend it. A series of um, different distributions that you could get in the real world that would give you the same Pali score. Um, the two colors are different vowels. Each dot is one token. And the Euclidean distance for the left data sets and the right data sets are different, but the Pali scores are the same. Um, now thinking about um, that point that I made about how each of those dots is one token um, brings me to the next point, which has to do with vowel dynamics. 
Um, lots of acoustic studies come from based on uh, midpoint formant values, but we know that dynamics are crucial in vowel identification. That's what um, vowel inherent spectral research, vowel inherent spectral change research has found. Um, and so there's a question of if we can or should incorporate um, formant dynamics into poli score analyses. Uh, there's a study by Aviat Savage and Robert Fox um, that, uh, that does this with another traditionally static analysis, which is um, the, the vowel space. Instead of plotting several tokens of midpoints and saying this is what someone's vowel space is based on that, they plotted uh, five formant samples at 20% duration, 35, 50, 65, and 80. These are pretty conventional in, um, in this, this research. Um, and so with this plot, if you look at the leftmost token, you can see almost a pentagon that's missing a leg. Um, this pooled those five formant samples without any temporal ordering in order to get a sense of what the vowel space is if you define a vowel as the whole arc it takes rather than just any given point in time. So my question is if we can do this with poli scores. Um, do pooled dynamics improve poli score analysis? And then sort of the perennial question of how well does production correspond to perception? In the big picture, my approach here is, is basically model selection. We have one y variable and we're going to regress it on different x variables to see which has the highest correlation. In these two plots, um, one dot represents one subject. We have some, some metric of merger in perception. We don't know what that is yet. I'll talk about which one I chose. Um, and we regress it on two different indices of how distinct someone is in production. And spoiler alert, they're gonna be poli scores in, in my analysis. And in this case, we would say index B correlates better with people's perception. And so that might have more behavioral validity. We should probably proceed with index B when measuring merger. Um, everything that I'm going to report on um, comes from 17 subjects um, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, they were all undergraduate males. We came into the sound booth in our phonetics lab and did a reading task followed by a perception task. So I'll talk about those two tasks in that order. Um, here was uh, some material from the reading list that participants uh, read from. This was the introductory material um, to get them acquainted with the words before they actually started reading. I looked at 14 H vowel D words. These are um, conventional in um, vowel inherent spectral change research. And I've circled the, the low back vowels um, as they appear here. My reading elicited 30 tokens of, uh, of each. There were six repetitions in five different sentence frames. And you can see the sentence frames in these practice items. Um, I know that that introduces prosodic variability, um, but uh, my experience has been that if, you, if participants have the same sentence frame, they just start to slur it and it stops being speech. And so um, I haven't yet done any analysis of how the different frames may have affected the acoustics, but that's how I got my data. So I had 30 tokens of each vowel. And I ended up dropping 10 in order to clean the data because of um, bad tracking on a lot of speakers, just the formant would jump a track. And I proceeded with 20 tokens of each vowel for each speaker. Um, some speakers had really good tracking. They just, everything was viable. And if that was the case, I dropped tokens based on extreme duration values, very, very quick or very, very long. Um, with those tokens, I then sampled them at those five key samples, um, getting F1 and F2. Now, once I had that data, I started making different subsets. I looked at um, just the midpoint samples themselves, the ones that, that are kind of more conventionally done when um, used when looking at um, merger studies. And I sort of set that aside. And then I looked at just the onset values and I set that aside as its own analysis. And then for subsets three and four, I started to pool dynamic models, um, similar to what was happening with the vowel space before. So for one model, it was the onsets and offsets pooled, almost as if I had doubled the token count. In the next, it was onsets, midpoints, and offsets. And then finally, it was 
taking just as was done in the vowel space, all five key samples um, so that um, instead of having 20 tokens in each, there were 100 points in each. And then I made a polite score for each of those. There were ended up being five per speaker, you know, given those five subsets um, that were progressively more dynamic. And so um, I've superimposed here that image from before, um, thinking about uh, the big picture, what we're looking for. Um, these different poli scores served as the different indices that we're going to regress um, people's perception on. So one model was regressed on midpoint based poli scores, one on onset based poli scores, so on and so forth. Uh, transitioning now to the perception data. Um, I generated some CLAT stimuli. Um, these are computer generated stimuli. They don't uh, sound like a human. They sound like vowels, but um, you wouldn't be fooled into thinking it was a, a person. These were um, from previous, a previous study that I had conducted. They were lone vowels. They didn't occur in words. And so in building the CLAT stimuli, you have to decide what formants to put in as the inputs. Um, I got my data from that, um, from more work by um, Yitzhavich et al. They reported on uh, the phonetics, the F1 and F2 from uh, speakers in Southeast Wisconsin, which is where my participants came from. So I wanted to have um, acoustics that would sound like what they have probably heard in their lives. And so my stimuli are based on F1 and F2 at those five key samples, just with linear interpolation between. And there's some more details about how I generated those stimuli, some other parameters. If you're interested, um, I'd be happy to, to share more about that. Once I had those two stimuli, I used them in a vowel identification task. I actually made those stimuli for, for all of those vowels and everything that you see here. Um, anyone who's administered an experiment in PROT will recognize this. Um, I folded those in with all those other stimuli, but the only ones I'm reporting on here are the low back vowels. So with those two vowels, there were five repetitions of each. And so there are 10 target trials that we're interested in. And to get a perceptual metric um, of merger, I looked at the confusion rate between the two low back vowels. How often did they say hod when they heard, you know, ah, and then how often did they um, select hod when they heard ah? Um, this ignores other errors that don't have anything to do with the, the merger. Um, as I think that they don't have anything to do with the merger, again, I'd be open to, to hearing if they do. But again, now we have what our y-axis value is going to be. Um, the, the merger in perception is the, the rate at which people confused one low back vowel for the other. And so uh, we have what we need. We have the, um, the confusion rate, the perception behavior and then different ways of cutting up um, their production behavior. And we want to see which one of these poli score approaches uh, corresponds best to their perception behavior. And so from here, it's, it's very simple linear regression and we look at which model has the best fit. Um, first, I just wanna show what the poli scores themselves were. Here we have the five different distributions for the five different subsets. Um, I've circled the midpoint subset because that's what's um, most conventionally done. Uh, they all have very similar shape because they're all the same underlying data just cut up in different ways. Um, they are all bimodal, indicating that speakers were either rather unmerged or rather merged. Um, that is a point that I want to come back to at the end, the idea of I got a certain poli score and that tells me whether someone is merged or not. That's something that I wanna talk, think more about. But in any event, in comparing these, the, the two static models have higher scores, um, which means that they are more, uh, these approaches say that the vowels are more distinct. Whereas if you use um, a dynamic approach, the poli scores say, no, these vowels are actually more similar to each other than, um, than you might think. So in the next slide, I'm going to regress the, the same uh, perception behavior on these five different um, poli scores. Again, you can see that the plots all look very similar because again, they're the same underlying data. Um, 
the, the static models do skew a little bit higher. Um, that corresponds to what we saw in the, in the last slide. And so the, the question is, um, how well do the different models correlate with uh, perception behavior? I'm reporting um, R squared here. It's actually adjusted R squared because there are other um, models that I, that I fit. And um, I'd love to talk about those uh, if there's uh, questions about them. But the correlation is highest for onset plus offset. If you just have those two points, that's what corresponds best to people's perception behavior. Um, all of the dynamic models have values that are higher than either of the static models. Um, and I was actually surprised that the, the midpoint models have the lowest correlation of all. Um, that just isn't what I would have guessed. Um, so onset and offset is optimal. This corresponds to uh, in vowel inherent spectral change, there's a general finding of the dual target hypothesis, which says that those two are the um, most important uh, formant samples basically for modeling vowels. Um, and static models here were outperformed by dynamic models. Now I know right away that the, the effect is small. There are small differences between the models and then the values overall are pretty low. Um, there isn't good correlation um, for, for any of them. But comparatively, the dynamic models have higher correlations than the static models. So turning to discussion, for the central questions of the study, do pooled dynamics improve PLI score analysis? Um, it looks like, yes, they seem to have higher um, behavioral validity. Um, they correspond better to people's perception behavior. Um, and how well does production correspond to perception? Right now, it looks like pretty weakly. Um, I wanna talk more about that in a minute, but, um, but before I, I wanna have a caveat for a place where I know that this will not improve poli score analysis. And that um, has to do with direction. So this figure is from Yatsevich et al again. Um, and if we think about the Southern vowel shift, if we think about the vowels A and I, they, cover very similar formant values, but they're, they're almost temporally reversed. A is fronting and rising, and I is lowering and backing. If we were to do this method of temporal pooling and we compared onsets and offsets, since the model doesn't know what's an onset and what's an offset, we're comparing the onset of one to the offset of the other, and it would just tell us these two are the same. Now that's not worse than a traditional approach because if we just did midpoints, we would just be comparing one equivalent region. Um, but it's clear that this method wouldn't improve um, this situation. So it's not like it's not like dynamic poli scores solve everything, obviously. But um, uh, but in cases other than this, it seems that that could improve things. Thinking about future work, probably the easiest next step is to use um, better stimuli. Um, and I say better just to mean more natural. Um, the stimuli here are synthetic. Um, they're, they're valid, people perceive them as speech, um, but they're, they're definitely unnatural. Um, and so now that I have these recordings from these speakers, um, I'd be interested in using their recordings as naturalistic tokens um, for, uh, for the next step of, of this research. The one that I'm really more interested in though um, is this perception production link. Um, I, very simplistic, I deliberately chose a simplistic model. I just regressed people's perception on their production. Um, and I chose specific ways to define those. Um, but I would be really interested in having just more descriptive statistics on this correlation. For example, if I had a hundred speakers do this same study would the data start to look, would they be linear? Um, would they instead start having a sigmoid distribution, more of that S shape that we see in a lot of language change data? Um, that can help us know if we do a study and we only got perception or we only got production, if we know the relationship a little bit better, that might help us you know, kind of know where we are in the, in the other modality. I noted that my data were largely bimodal in their PLI scores. I'd be interested to see if that continues or if you got more speakers, if it would be continuous. I know just from looking at other speakers that I got who did different perception tasks that they do span the whole range of PLI scores. Um, they filled in the, the middle part, but I'd be curious to see as you got more numbers, more speakers, if that washes out, if it does stay bimodal. <clears throat> 
And then taking a like a big step back, we said I said at the beginning that Euclidean distance is maybe conceptually less similar to merger than Pi score is. But if you wanted to look at it empirically, I we could repeat this analysis instead of using Pi scores with Euclidean distance and compare them side by side just to see is it the case that Pi scores outperform uh, Euclidean distance in terms of how well they correspond to people's perception behavior. And then um, the last uh, question that I had was about benchmark values. Like I mentioned before, can you tell merged status from a Pali score? If you go and measure someone and they give you a score of 0.35, um, does that mean anything on its own? What are the chances that it means something on its own? I think um, more work on this, on this relationship, just descriptive work, um, can help us um, answer those questions and just help guide methodology for how to do uh, studies on vowel merger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was so interesting. Um, so we have some time for questions before our next speaker. We have about eight minutes. And again, uh, if you're just joining us, you can either raise your hand and then you can ask your question out loud or you can write it in the Q&A and I'll read it out for you. So. Um, it looks like Valerie Freeman had a question, which then you answered on slide 29, but she has a follow-up question. And so she's asking, how might we treat the measurements as ordered in order to take trajectory direction into account, meaning onset, offset, I'm assuming? Yeah, so um, so I had emailed Joey earlier. I cited Joey Stanley's uh, blog earlier. I had emailed Joey earlier about this, and he suggested something very similar. Um, he said, um, that uh, he's pretty sure that you could just run the MANOVA model where you have, so, so the way that I ran the model I had onset points and offset points. And what I gave the model was F1 and F2, but I didn't tell the model where they came from. If you added a third variable um, and the, that variable was time point so that you had half of them were onset, half of them were offset, um, Joey was speculating that might um, that might give temporal structure to, um, to this model. I frankly don't know the math well enough of MANOVA to understand if there's um, some kind of weirdness that that introduces, um, but that's the best guess that I have right now. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Just while we're waiting for some more comments to come in, I wanted to follow up on that because I was wondering if maybe because you are interested in forming contours and you want this dynamic information, but then you end up making it into a discrete analysis by setting it into the, which I can appreciate is what people have always done, but you know, you could take a leaf out of like eye tracking analyses and use growth curve models to model form and trajectories. And then you could have, you could compare the slope of the trajectory or something between speakers or the area under the slope or something, the way that this is done um, uh, with the uh, like sentence processing and, and speech perception stuff with eye tracking. So that could be just, then you would be actually getting um, more of a continuous information instead of discrete, but then it's less comparable to previous work. Yeah, I think that's that's very helpful. Thank you. And I have another question, if I can, <laughs> um, while we're waiting for some more maybe to come in. I'm sure I missed this, but. I'm assuming a high poli score means that they're less merged, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. I wanted to make sure. I was like, it must be. Yeah. Um, I had I had thought about plotting the poli scores in the opposite order for that reason. Um, yeah, it's it's it is a little bit because um, we talk about poli scores as a measure of overlap, but like I guess properly they're a measure of distinction. But but yeah. Like we have another question coming in. Uh, Holman Say is asking, I'm wondering if you had different stimuli with different phonetic contexts, do you think this method would still be an improvement over the midpoint method? Yeah, um, it's it's hard for me to say um, that it that it couldn't be. 
um, because uh, that was something I was very aware of um, in preparing this work that um, I'm, I'm commenting on a metric that's you know becoming interesting in sociophonetics, um, but I'm using very speech science um, approaches, kind of using, for example, just HVLD. Um, and so I think that that would be an important next step, especially since it's it's pretty common to use a variety of contexts to establish you know the cloud of like what a vowel is. Um, I feel like you would want to 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 match them as as best you could, um, but but I I think that then the question uh, just shifts into instead of having one context, how is static versus dynamic? Then it's just when we have more representative data, how is static versus dynamic? I think that that would still be useful. Uh, Jason, you can go ahead. I think you have the ability to turn your mic on and off. I, I don't know why that is, but anyway, it works. Um, uh, yeah, I was just wondering about the confusion matrix for the perception experiment. Uh, you mentioned that you're only modeling those uh, kind of caught, caught mutual confusions. So were those the predominant confusions or were, was there a, were there a lot of other confusions as well? Yeah, those, those were the primary confusions. Um, the rest were... Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember. I I have the figure in my mind, um, but uh, but the remaining confusions that weren't the low back vowels, um, if I'm remembering, constituted about fifteen percent of responses across participants, um, and I don't remember there being any um, any noticeable patterns um, like there being only one other vowel that they that um, that was a that it was confused with. But I don't remember precisely offhand. I'm sorry about that. Well, I guess I guess one other way forward then would be to think about um, actually um, uh, modeling the task more closely. So the um, the score that you have of overlap is kind of abstract in that it's based upon lots of tokens. And then the perceptual measure that you have is also abstract and that it's based upon, you know, confusion, you know, probability of confusion over many tokens. But, um, you know, the participants task, you know, that happens trial by trial. So on each trial, they're comparing the stimulus with their kind of representation based upon past experience. And they've got to make that decision on the spot. So, uh, I mean, another way, uh, uh, way forward is to think about, you know, what's happening in the moment in comparing, you know, one token with the distribution to of tokens that you can use to represent an individual. And then in, in that way, you can use, um, maybe predict some of those individual differences based upon the production patterns of the listeners. Yeah, thank you. Any last minute questions before we finish up? Okay, well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was a really interesting talk. Um, and we've got about one minute uh, before our next talk begins. Does the screen share look all right? Yes, it does. Great. And I just realized I have to undo it. Sorry. I don't know, this time it did give me the good sound. Okay. Okay, we're going to move to our last talk in this session. Um, Matt Paytack will be presenting uh, with Jeremy Steffman, although Jeremy isn't here tonight, if I'm uh, correct on that. Uh, Matt will be. Yes, thanks. 
Uh, so today I'll be talking about um, uh, mixed voicing in uh, Yemba voiced aspirates. Um, as I move into this, I want to start uh, by thanking some people. Um, in particular, Roland Tanku, um, our main consultant, uh, who you'll hear uh, throughout this paper. I uh, also want to thank Harold Torrance and uh, the various members of the Field Methods course on Yemba at UCLA. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, research helpers, Jay Weller and Brian Gonzalez. Um, Jay is here at this conference, go say hi to them. And uh, Florian Leonet for discussion as well. So, um, it's sort of a truism that um, in spite of the name, uh, the so-called uh, voiced aspirated consonants uh, generally have breathy voicing after their release rather than voicelessness. Uh, here, for example, in some data that I've uh, pulled from Oweri Igbo, uh, we see that uh, the voiced aspirated stop shown on the right um, actually just has non-modal phonation that occurs after the release of the stop. Uh, it's breathy rather than voiceless, and it continues all the way through the vowel. Um, voiced aspirates that have uh, associated breathy phonation uh, and which sound like this, of course, modal on the left and breathy on the right are uh, uh, the most common kind of voiced aspirate. Um, they're attested throughout the Indian subcontinent and elsewhere. Um, this leads us to a more general claim about consonant voicing. Uh, the claim is that, uh, which goes all the way back to Laudafogate 1971, is that there are no consonants attested, which have voicing during their constriction and voiceless aspiration at release. Uh, from time to time, uh, possible examples of this kind of voicing, which I've given a sort of crude auto-segmental representation up here, come up. But the phonetic evidence usually ends up pointing to breathy or slack voice release instead on closer inspection. In this talk, uh, we would like to provide a more solid counterexample. Um, and we have descriptive and analytical parts. Uh, we'd like to claim that voiced aspirates in Yemba have precisely the sort of laryngeal timing and events that are said to be unattested, voicing during closure and voiceless aspiration after release. Um, there are descriptive and analytical parts. Uh, we'll start by uh, familiarizing the audience with the Yemba consonant inventory and going over what the typical realization of the aspirated segments is. Then we will go through analyzing uh, voice quality using electroglottography and acoustic measures of voicing strength and quality, uh, which will show us that a voice then voiceless realization is typical for our four speakers. Um, at the end, we discuss some implications. So about Yemba, which uh, you may know better as Chang or Chang Bamileke. Um, it is a grass fields Bantu language uh, spoken in the West region of Cameroon and in diaspora populations in North America and Europe by about three to 400,000 people. Uh, the two major settlements in Cameroon are marked in blue uh, in the map at the right. Yemba is closely related to about seven other languages in the Bamileke group. Um, its speakers are generally bilingual in French and the language is generally regarded as healthy. While it is most famous for its very complex tonal phonology, we will be focusing on the consonants today. And uh, under a certain analysis, there are quite a few of them. Um, Yemba and the rest of the Bamileke group are noted for having an aspiration contrast uh, in their onset consonants, in addition to the contrast in pre-voicing that you usually see throughout Bantu. Um, Yemba is particularly unusual in another respect. Um, its aspiration contrast is licensed not only by uh, various obstruents, but continuant obstruents and non-obstruents, including nasals and approximants. Uh, so this is Yemba's consonant inventory. Uh, for space, we've indicated where an aspirated unaspirated pair exists with color coding. And uh, as we can see, nearly all of the uh, consonants can occur um, contrasting for aspiration. Only the couple of grayed out consonants don't have some kind of aspirated equivalent. And the red ones are both voiced and aspirated. Uh, there is also the matter of the voiced prenasalized stops. There are no contrastively voiced stops, but voiced prenasalized stops do also occur as allophones of the approximants and P when a nasal prefix immediately precedes them. Uh, this also applies uh, here. Um, in addition, the uh, phonetic voiced uh, prenasalized stops occur when a nasal prefix is concatenated with any one of these segments. Um, 
And we uh, tend to analyze this as uh, the aspirated stops come from the aspirated approximants and aspirated P and so on. Um, there's good uh, alternation evidence for this. Some examples, uh, if we look at some representative tokens of the voiced aspirates, we can see that aspiration here does not look very much like the breathy release that we saw uh, in the first slide. So I will play the audio for the uh, example on the left and then the right uh, on the left. And then on the right. One more time. So uh, that voiceless quality to the aspiration seems to be the case even after some of the more unusual segments. Uh, so here we have um, a voiced uh, lateral approximant, and here's the sound on the left. Hello. Hello. And here's the sound on the right. Hello. Hello. The period of voicelessness before the vowel seals still seems pretty consistently present. Uh, the voiced aspirated fricatives present us with a slight variant on this theme in that sometimes the aspiration is realized like a voiceless copy of the voiced onset fricative. Uh, so sort of a, a ZS cluster in this case. Here's the uh, unaspirated version on the left. Is it? Is it? And here's the aspirated version. Is it? Is it? And one more time. Is it? Is it? So this brings us to the uh, phonetic study, where we are proposing more precisely to characterize voicing during closure and uh, after a constriction release uh, for the Yemba voiced aspirates of various manners. Um, to this end, we'll be using audio and EGG data to evaluate the strength of the voice source uh, and also the voice quality for any parts uh, flanking aspiration, which are consistently phonated in some way. We were able to get materials from four speakers, two recorded in the lab in 2019, and material from two more was gathered from uh, an existing Yemba, English, and French audio lexicon. The lexical items we collected had unaspirated or aspirated voiced consonants uh, of the various manners we just discussed, um, prenasalized stops, oral or prenasalized fricatives, and approximants, which are all oral. We did not analyze any voiceless sounds for this study. Uh, although we are happy to talk about these in the Q&A. We collected a total of 2,022 segments or subsegments uh, to analyze, uh, with uh, more material coming from the corpus, uh, the lexicon corpus, than the lab recordings. We collected audio and EGG for three speakers. Uh, only audio was available for the uh, last speaker who was in the lexicon. Um, after manual segmentation, uh, into constriction, aspiration, and vowel portions, which I'll just be denoting as C, H, and V uh, throughout. Um, we calculated the voice quality measures uh, that we see below over the entire uh, entirety of each segment uh, using voice sauce. Um, let's talk about these in turn. So strength of excitation on the one hand uh, is a measure of the uh, strength of the voice source um, at each epic, uh, sort of a positive zero crossing of the signal. Um, we will be using this to check for the presence of a voice source or the relative strength of it at least. We also collected three measures that are often used to quantify breathiness uh, in an acoustic signal. Uh, the contact quotient, which we got from the EGG signal, and Kepstral peak prominence and H1 minus A3 corrected uh, from the audio signal. Not all of the measures were calculated for all of the segments. Uh, I need to point out in particular that the uh, acoustic voice quality measures we're not calculated for the fricatives since the superlaryngeal noise source presents a pretty big confound. And as we will show momentarily, there was really not much of a periodic signal um, in the aspiration interval to calculate voice quality measures over. So we restrict ourselves to uh, strength of excitation for that. For analysis, since we're very concerned with the dynamics of the voice source here, we submitted uh, strength of excitation as a time series to an AR1 GAM. Uh, we submitted uh, z-scored means for the other voice quality measures to Bayesian mixed effects regression. Both of these had a similar model structure, uh, uh, smoothing or regressing for manner and aspiration and their interaction with random smooths or intercepts by speaker. Uh, we do visualize some of the voice quality time series, uh, but we're not gonna model them here um, just for uh, space and time concerns. Uh, and when we do show time series, we'll focus on closure quotient since it uh, is calculated for the widest range of consonant manners. 
uh, and it's more of a direct articulatory signal, which is nice. Now for some results. Uh, we'll start with strength of excitation, um, and we'll cover each of the three intervals. So first, consonant strength of excitation by manner. Uh, what we see here uh, is that a voice source is pretty consistently present in the voice dot sets, even when they're aspirated, um, which are shown in the blue-purple curves here. Uh, here we can see first and foremost differences among the manners and uh, strength of excitation, which have been described in the papers cited in the methods section. Um, the prenasalized manners have quite strong strength of excitation. Uh, they have a very strong periodic voice source. Uh, the other manners, especially the fricatives, have lower overall SOE, but that's expected um, given the way they're produced. The only effect of aspiration on the preceding consonant uh, strength of excitation for any of the manners is more or less local. Um, right before aspiration, in other words, which occurs uh, just off the right edge of each of these plots. Um, just to move on now. Uh, now for vowels. In the following vowel, there are some non-local differences uh, in strength of excitation, but these don't reach significance. The uh, confidence intervals here uh, remain overlapping over the whole interval of the segments. Uh, the effect that we get uh, which is more of a trend, only occurs after the non-prenasalized manners. Um, we will be revisiting this when we get back to the voice quality measures. Now for aspiration itself. Uh, strength of excitation is much lower overall uh, during the aspiration interval. Um, at the left, we have a sort of summary figure showing the uh, GAM smooth just with respect to time alone, kind of for all segments. Um, Recall that most of the phones flanking aspiration have strength of excitation in the 0.03 to 0.04 range, uh, if not higher. Aspiration doesn't get above 0.01 until the very end. Uh, it rises abruptly, seemingly in preparation for the following vowel. Um, uh, in fact, across most of its duration, it uh, significantly differs, though we're not showing it here, from all of the voiced phones we've examined so far. And it doesn't differ significantly from zero um, at several points. Uh, and uh, more saliently for several manners as we see on the right. Um, so it doesn't seem if there is a voice source here, it's a very consistent or strong one. Um, let's turn now to the other voice quality measures. We'll start with closure quotient. Uh, the Bayesian model that we ran finds a credible main effect of aspiration on closure quotient during constriction, along with some interactions with manner, uh, which we've given red asterisks here. Um, the lowering effect on closure quotient that we see, regardless of manner, uh, suggests reduced vocal fold contact, uh, which we take to be indicative of breathiness. Uh, but the time series that are shown at the bottom suggest that this difference is mainly due, again, uh, to uh, the, the difference mainly emerges right as aspiration is coming up uh, in the order of events. Uh, so mostly after 75% duration uh, for each of these segments. Um, again, fricatives are somewhat of an exception here. Uh, but we expect their phonation to work differently because of source-source interactions here. Um, for other voice quality measures, we get similar results, a credible main effect, uh, and an interaction of aspiration, and in this case, just approximate manner. Uh, both lowered uh, capstral peak prominence, or CPP, and the raised H1H3, or H1A3, pardon me, suggest breathiness uh, for different reasons, uh, although the uh, differences that we see in these two measures are smaller. And uh, interestingly, they're less localized to the right edge of the consonant, uh, mostly in the case of CPP at top. Now onto vowels. Uh, we find again a, a credible effect of aspiration for all three of the measures. Um, closure quotient, capsule peak prominence, and H1 minus A3 corrected. Interestingly, the time series uh, that we see at the right uh, suggest that the non-modal phonation extends over the entire vowel, unlike uh, what we saw for the consonants. Uh, this is especially visible in the acoustic measures in the bottom two plots, uh, rather the acoustic measures uh, in the bottom two plots that we get from the audio. So bringing it all together, Yemba uh, voiced aspirates from the evidence that we've presented here seem to exhibit mostly modal voicing or perhaps slightly breathy voicing uh, during their consonant constrictions, followed by a voiceless, probably spread glottis uh, target, uh, which immediately follows. 
Um, and we think that this target is pretty consistently achieved in production such that we think it's specified at some level. Um, specifically, uh, we'll assemble this now. The strength of excitation data uh, suggests that there is little to no voice source uh, that uh, contributes to the energy present in aspiration. Um, and strength of excitation and the other voice quality measures taken together uh, suggest that a modal voicing target is typically achieved early on in consonantal closure, which uh, only then in anticipation of the upcoming spread glottis or voiceless aspiration target uh, pretty rapidly changes um, in glottal state over the course of the last 25% or so of the duration of the, uh, of the closure. Uh, vowels after aspiration, on the other hand, show more general perseveratory breathiness um, over a lot more of the duration, uh, we think. It's a very slight effect, however. So we think that uh, this yields some interesting discussion points. Uh, first of all, uh, taking a step back, uh, we think that this reinforces the need for subsegmental representations where events can be ordered and phased. Uh, like we've sort of suggested crudely with an auto-segmental representation in the previous slide. Um, I'm citing Q theory here, but articulatory phonology can presumably also handle gestural constellations like this. Uh, while voiced and then voiceless is a pretty unusual specification uh, for laryngeal specification of a consonant, uh, it could still be generated by these representational theories. And now we've seen a real life example of where such a representation might be needed. Uh, it also suggests that some cases uh, where segments greatly resembling the voiced aspirates in Yemba have um, been sort of analyzed away in the past, um, we might reconsider these as uh, the phonation contours they were originally proposed to be in some cases. Um, at the very least, there now seems to be less of a motivation for rejecting a mixed voicing representation uh, on its face. Finally, um, I would like to point out uh, that Yemba does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of the closely Bami, uh, there are a lot of closely related Bami Lake languages um, spoken nearby, the red and yellow dots on the map there. And uh, most of these have been described with a qualitatively similar aspiration contrast that cross cuts voicing on at least some manners, almost always stops. Um, and then up the chain, we kind of have affricates, fricatives, and the uh, non obstruents uh, following on that. So while the arrangement in Yemba is pretty rare, um, it, uh, parts of it are pretty well attested uh, in the neighboring Bamileke languages, uh, which makes Bamileke potentially an excellent place to examine the factors that apparently make this very unusual articulatory event um, surprisingly stable, uh, at least judging from its appearance in all of these related languages. One consideration um, that Berkson brought up in her 2019 paper uh, on breathy sonorance in Marathi is that breathiness frequently ends up falling out of the system by merging with modal voicing, particularly for sonorance. Um, using a voiceless rather than breathy release for this contrast, as Yemba seems to have come to do, um, uh, while it's considerably more difficult, um, it uh, would be a sort of enhancement perhaps that makes the aspiration contrast more easily recoverable from a range of manners. Um, the factors I should also note uh, underpinning the manner specific production uh, aspects that we saw need to be explored in more detail in probably in Yemba and in other Bamileke languages. And we didn't do that here, uh, but we're happy to address it in the Q and A and uh, we have to stop somewhere. So uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Matt. That was a very interesting talk. Um, so if you have just recently joined us, uh, there are a couple different ways that you can ask your question. We have about 10 minutes for questions. You can either raise your hand and ask your question out loud, or you can write it in the Q&A and I will read it out for you. Um, so we'll wait for some questions to come in while people process that. Uh, yeah, Chelsea, go ahead. I was wondering if you could comment on the evidence for this being aspiration rather than a separate H segment. Um, so funnily enough, um, this analysis has been attempted. Um, the problem is that, um, while it's a good question, um, there is an H segment in the language. It is extremely marginal 
Um, uh, it appears in, I think, three loan words. Um, and uh, it um, also should be noted that consonant clusters aren't permitted um, in the language of any sort. Um, so it would, it, the explaining this away as a consonant cluster when it looks a lot like, you know, a phonation associated with the release of segments, even though it's tempting, uh, it would be almost equally stipulative in this case. Um, you'd have to create a special group of consonant clusters that exist just to explain away aspiration. So we're not particularly inclined to do that. Um, uh, but thank you for the question. It's, it's something we should probably uh, work into the presentation a bit more. Sorry, there's a siren going on outside my apartment, which is why I uh, kept my audio off for a second. Um, if there isn't another question coming uh, in, I can. Sorry. Sorry. Did someone else have another question? The siren is passed now. Yes. Chris, did you raise your hand? Chris, did you have a question? Sorry, I was just uh, permitted to unmute just now. Um, so, hi, I look forward to, uh, Chris Geisler, Yeah, I look forward to um, seeing more from this and where it goes. And I would need to look at the, your, your data plots more. Um, but I'm wondering if you think there could be a lot of other languages where this is the kind that 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 have just been considered like South, you know, South Asian style breathy voicing, and we've just seen this and then said, oh, well, that it's you know got a breathy release rather than um, something more like what you see here. Given that, yeah, it seems articulatorily more difficult, depending on. Well, we don't really know about how the, depending on how quickly you can move your, your the muscles in your glottis, but um, seems like there would be a functional pressure, um, like it, it could be more diachronically stable. Right. Yeah. That's that's um, in a rambly fashion what uh, we sort of uh, got to in the last slide. Um, uh, in addition, so the, both of the um, language um, families that uh, are pointed out in the uh, inadvertently um, glossed over. These are in the um, Khoisan uh, family of languages, which isn't actually a family, it's three families um, or so. Um, and these have very large inventories, um, uh, often um, extraordinarily large if you analyze what look like um, contour segments as single segments instead of clusters. Um, and actually there's been a lot of debate uh, uh, in the Khoisanist, I guess, um, literature over whether these are clusters or unit segments. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen some of that. It's yeah, it's a mess. So in in um, in uh, various two languages, um, you you can get segments which are like uh, uh, like voiced and then ejective uh, or something like that, um, and they seem to pattern as a unit. Um, so there are other cases like this. Um, the uh, more to the specific example you brought up, I have heard kind of almost apocryphal descriptions of some South Asian languages in which, um, like the example that comes to mind is that, you know, a citation of a citation of a paper at some point said that John Gumpers, when he was doing his sociolinguistic work on Hindi in the 50s, noticed that some people had breathiness for the uh, voiced aspirates and others had actual aspiration. but whatever that data is, it has fallen through the cracks and it's just not really in the record. Um, I, I would welcome a, a re-examination of um, how, uh, how the, uh, the segments in South Asian languages actually do come out in a broader range of um, instances. Yeah, though, thank you for the question. Yeah. There's a lot of missing, uh, uh, even, even just a, a lot of missing uh, phonetic data that along the lines of what you presented here that I think could be really insightful. Thanks. 
Thanks for that question. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. Thanks for the talk. Just curious, how are aspirated voiceless fricatives such as post alveolar fricative sh realized? Aha. Uh -huh. um, so you found another fun corner of the uh, phonology. Um, so without the voicing that's present here, um, you get a voiceless copy uh, of a voiceless segment uh, for a lot of speakers such that they end up in, in some cases sounding like long fricatives. Um, interestingly, um, I don't recall that uh, affricates do the same thing. Um, so like a uh, aspirated ch uh, doesn't sound like ch, it sounds like ch. Um, so there's some kind of funny structured geometry thing going on here. Um, it's specifically the fricatives that this happens to. So yes, like s, which I know s means fish. Um, and uh, that usually comes out as a s long s followed by a w. Um, so that I hope answers your question. Yeah, Jason, go ahead. Um, not great stuff. Um, I was just uh, wondering a little bit about tone and if tonotactics kind of uh, reinforce the stability of this. I was thinking of stuff like, you know, um, high tones follow th following these uh, voice aspirated segments, for example, or something else that could help um, reinforce the stability of the pattern. So bringing up tone is um, a really good thing to do here. Thank you for the question. So like a, like a very bad Africanist, I've not transcribed tone um, in this talk uh, because the, well, in part because the tonal system in Chung is legendarily um, complicated. It's the sort of system that Larry Hyman works on for 10 years and figures out about half of it or something like that. So um, it's almost certainly some minor factor in, in how this is produced, I wouldn't be shocked. At the very least, uh, the fundamental frequencies of the uh, uh, items that we're analyzing are all over the place because of tonal contrasts. And so probably we should be controlling for that in our analyses. Um, as for how tone would reinforce this contrast, um, it's less immediately certain um, how that would work. Um, though, are you kind of getting it um, uh, well, did, did you have something specific in mind? Um, no, I, I don't know anything about the, the tone of the, the tonal patterns of this language. So it was just um, if there are kind of tonotactics that are kind of related to uh, aspiration, then, you know, it, this could be, yeah. So um, that I was thinking that the voicelessness of the aspiration could go hand in hand with the tones and words that uh, it frequently uh, occurs with. So that kind of uh, factor in stabilizing. Right. Well, if we're looking for um, sort of um, interactions between uh, phonation and tone, I, I'm pretty sure that just hasn't been studied at all, unfortunately. Um, it would be interesting to see if there was a, an effect on F0 of the following vowel, for example. Um, uh, of this aspiration, especially because there's a sequence of uh, voicing and then uh, voiceless aspiration. I should put a quick plug in here, by the way, for um, Jay Weller, one of our um, uh, research helpers, um, did their own project um, on the uh, effects on the uh, formants uh, following aspiration and voicing, et cetera, because this is a really interesting cross-cutting system. And I believe that's in a poster session tomorrow. Um, so if you're interested in that, go check that out. Thank you. Thank you. We have time maybe for one more quick question. Otherwise, we can end it there. It's been a long day. It has been a long day, yes. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Um, uh, Feel free to get in touch with any of the speakers if you have any outstanding questions that you weren't able to ask here. Um, my cat and I <laughs> will say goodnight to you now. Um, he's there in the background and um, look forward to seeing everyone at future sessions. Bye. Thank you. Session will be closing now.